haben jetzt heute Erdgeist hier und die Beata Hubrig. Die beiden haben sich mit dem Thema sehr intensiv auseinandergesetzt und werden uns jetzt erzählen, wie man was dagegen tun kann oder was man dagegen schon getan hat, was man künftig noch dagegen zu tun kann. Die Beata ist Rechtsanwältin in Berlin und engagiert sich bei Freifunk und beim Tor Project. Und Erdgeist ist Open Source Developer, kommt auch aus Berlin und macht nebenbei noch Chaos Radio und den Ohm Podcast und engagiert sich im CCC. Ähm, ein herzliches Applaus für die beiden. Hello and welcome. You're listening to the English translation of Fighting Spamigation at the 33rd Chaos Communication Congress. So, why do we bother with, this, with a niche topic like this one? But um, some time ago we noticed ourselves getting more and more furious because there are, a, there are legal officers who... Uh, hmm who specialize in automatically sending out cease and desist letters um, who use unfortunate analogies in um, courts of law. They use the law to their advantage um, to minimize the risk as um, as best they can. And they do this at an industrial scale. And the thing that makes me furious about this is that there is collateral damage. For instance, um, with regard to uh, teenagers who submit images to social media, And you see legal officers who send these uh, cease and desist letters at a really large scale to you know, make money out of it. And it's no longer hmm. these, these legal officers have, have transformed into an industry an industry that uses cease and desist letters as their business model. And the collateral damage is sometimes smaller, smaller businesses who make some mistakes in their impressum, which is a certain, um, which is certain data that all that um, all websites have to publish, uh, publish on, yeah, all businesses have to publish on their websites. So, so even if then, even if these cease and desist le letters are actually unlawful, um, some some people are so afraid of them that they would f allow these seasons desist letters to continue and will pay the money the fine that is invoked on there so in order to start this topic in a way that we can that you can understand we now have to do the boring legalese that's important here Now, let's imagine there's something file shared and there's a huge um, law lawyer firm that has asked a firm to check whether there's something that is um, protected by some sort of property law. And then they will s find the IP address, will find the internet, the ISP, that is the internet service provider. And they will go to a judge. The judge will give them s a formal letter that allows them to go to the ISP, that will give them the data of 
the person who who's this IP belongs to. And then they will write a 50-page document that looks quite scary. And they send them out in mass. All of them have blank um, payment checks, basically, that you can just send out. What they actually tell, what is actually written in this letter is that if you pay this, we will not, um, we will not go to court with your um, infraction, with your copyright infraction. At this point, once you get this letter, the cease and desist letter, you're actually already in court officially. The procedure has already started. So if you, if you get this letter and ignore it, it's bad for you. So the best way to deal with this is actually, this doesn't, this is not right, this does not apply to me. So the, the easiest way to get out of this the, for users is actually to just pay the money. But that's why a lot of people just pay the money, even though officially they're not entitled to this money. So if you can prove that you're not the person um, committing this copyright infringement, sometimes it's quite easy to get out of it, but sometimes they're quite persistent. So sometimes you will get a better offer. You will, oh, well, you, you were supposed to pay 400 euros, but now you only have to pay 200 euros. But some of them are actually sold to more aggressive um, firms that will then do this more aggressively. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, there's three ways to resolve this. One way is after three years, the term on this is limited and you leave and it goes away. Another way is for a... Um, another way is to... Sorry. So I'm on the part of or. This is because I found many, um, many topics, many, many things that simply don't work or shouldn't be allowed to work as they do. That sometimes work in, in front of a court and sometimes they don't. We, we don't even have a, a very clear cut um, justice. We, we don't have a lot of precedence. I've concerned myself with this. I've been concerning myself with this since 2012 when I met some uh, of the Freifunk folks who told me of the um, of this cease and desist industry. And I thought that it was important to actually find out where these cease and desist letters come from and what they're for. And I'm going to tell you 10 things that aren't okay in a, in a legal context about these cease and desist letters. It's a, there's even more to these, but these are 10 things. It all starts with the, um, with the right to information that, um, the copyright holders have, and they um, visit their local court for the internet service provider, and the copyright holders claim they use lots of legal terms to claim that file sharing has been committed at a large scale. 
and they want to know who owned the IP addresses at the time. And the law covers the duty to give this information, but only if the um, the alleged crimes have been committed at a large scale, at a at an industrial scale. And this industrial scale is defined, and it's defined as the number of copyright infringements. But there is no number. There, there aren't even any estimations. There are no estimates. Is it five times five, fifty, five hundred, five thousand times? No estimates. Like um, it's this work. It came out in such and such year, and these people copied it. But the, the mere, the mere. Um, presumption that um, that it's that this work has been copied millions of times potentially um, that's enough to to claim that it's um, these infringements have been committed at an industrial scale with no need to be able to prove it so these claims really should not be allowed to happen. It also means that people who sit at home and watch a film and automatically upload it, because that's how their file sharing works, suddenly become copyright infringers at, a, at an industrial scale without realizing it. And um, only this permits copyright holders to access the uh, IP information. The second thing that's been bothering me this entire time is the basis of these um, of these claims. The basis is firstly the IP address and secondly a hash value. There are no further investigations, no further information. That's it. That's all that these claims are based on. And then there's this lovely thing of this lovely idea of license analogy. Of course, in a um, in a civil procedure, the question is always: Has there been a damage? And if so, how much? How how high was the damage? So if I consume a film at home illegally, in that case, I didn't go to a you know go to a store or use other legal means of um, of accessing that films. I didn't pay 30 euros or 50 euros to watch that film. Is it reasonable to assume a damage of a double-digit figure? Yes, it would be. And if, if that were so, these... Um, all these proceedings wouldn't be, you know, they, they wouldn't be lucrative. They wouldn't, they wouldn't make sense, and that's why there is license analogy. And these, um, the people sending out the cease and desist letters, claim that you would have had to purchase a license that would have allowed you to um, distribute the our works um, internationally around the whole world. And of course, these don't exist. These are purely fictional, but. Um, they're used to um, to push these claims into into triple digits because, of course, nobody would buy these licenses. They're, as I said, they're purely fictional. And then the um, the amount that's well, it's purely arbitrary the the amount that is used in these legal procedures. Some some judges say it's a thousand euros. Some say it's 5,000 euros. This would be local local courts. And there are even some judges who's, who's, who claim it's 15,000 euros. And there's, there's no reason 
to this. There's no. It's it's purely arbitrary. It's like wheel of fortune when you when you stand in front of in front of a court. And it's so important because this is because all other costs depend on the um, on uh, um, on what what is being claimed for on the uh, amount involved. So your legal fees depend on 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 these amounts. So, so this is a way to deter people. It actually isn't about this one person that in civil law, that is in terms of um, not respecting someone's copyright, but the actual point is to deter other people from doing this because this is an expensive thing. Now, that's something that I'm having a real problem with because in civil law, um, the deterrence effect cannot exist. Even in... So... Now, the third thing is that the technical information that you usually only get in court and not outside of court, not before. And there you really, it's really a question of faith. Some, some judges say, well, I don't really believe there's something in there, while other judges say, well, I really believe this sort of information. So next thing, it's, it's about whether you need to control. You as providing internet access to someone need to control the people using your internet access for their uh, property law. Now, if we actually want to have that, then we do have a problem with data security because you either need to log everyone's internet access or you need to check their computers. And then we even enter into the problematic of a very big German law of the secrecy of telecommunications. Now, unfortunately, we are already, we're already discussing this again after, after European level um, court order. There's also the nice problem of the interference liability. That is, if, you, if I can prove that it wasn't me do, doing this copyright infringement, then someone will still say, well, you opened, you opened it up to, danger, to this danger. Now, in my opinion, that's complete bullshit because you opened the internet because the internet is open. The internet is just a network. The internet is not a source of danger as such. Because a source of danger is only true if you can't avoid the danger. But you can avoid danger when actually accessing the internet. We always do generally time and time again. And if I don't have a source of danger, then it isn't my duty to make sure that other people do not um, commit damages. So the internet should be seen like an infrastructure, like the telephone, like the autobahn, the highway system. But the access as such is not 
um, is not a source of danger per se. Was mit dem Lebensaufhalt überhaupt nichts zu tun hat. Die tatsächliche Vermutung, äh, wenn ich Anschlussinhaber bin, dann bin ich auch Täter. The presumption that if I own the internet access, then I also, then I'm also the proprietor, perpetrator. Now this assumes that more than 50% of people live alone, have a closed network, do not ever get, have guests or, but, but that is obviously not true. There's, most people share their internet access. So we can't assume that the perpetrator is also the person having the person that has the contract with the ISP, with the internet service provider. And lastly, the thing that kind of makes this a business model that's lucrative is that you don't really have a risk. Like if you're the one sending the cease and desist letter, you don't actually have a risk, you don't carry a risk, because the law says that only if you can sh show that it was uh, negligent to send out the cease and desist letter. But being negligent means that you need to know the person that you sent the cease and desist letter to. So you will never incur any damages yourself. So there's there's no financial risk for the people who send out these cease and desist letters. And of course, this makes sense if you consider that you have these huge legal offices basing their entire basing their entire business models on this. Um, and they they give serial numbers to uh, to their cases um, that reset each year, and we guess that it's about ten thousand cease and desist letters they send out a year. And if you like, this is this leads us to estimate that it's you know we we have about eight digits. Um, that there is a total sum of eight digits. Um, in all these all these claims so it would not make sense for them to have to pay for other people's lawyers they they really want to prevent this from happening and um they f they hit a they they found a gold mine really the in um Um, because the law limits their their expenses to like not even dozens of euros, so their business model would vanish immediately if you could prove that these cease and desist letters had been sent out negligent in um, negligent <laughs> negligently. Because suddenly they would not only not get paid, they would also have to pay other people's legal expenses. So I think we can do something about this. We created the Abmann Beantworter, which roughly translates to cease and desist answering machine. Yes, we created this tool so that as many people as possible who had received these letters unfairly might be able to defend themselves. It's these, um, you, you only have like very, like usually two weeks to reply to the letter, but not from the, not from, you know, the date um, when it, when you received it, but from the date when it was sent out. So, as a lawyer, I'm not capable. As, I'm a lawyer myself, and I cannot find a lawyer whom I trust within the ten days I've got left to to reply to this letter. So, to 
allow more people to defend themselves in court, we created the Abmahn Beantworter. And we wanted to make it um, make it simple. And we want you to work on the actual letter itself. So, for instance, tell you about the date of these of the letter or the the serial number in order to get people to think about what what they did at that um, at that point in time um, which in turn gives them um, a reason why the season this this letter was unfair and was sent out unfairly and the second step next is that we want to start next year to get the people sending out these letters to um, we want to force them to to actually want to force them We want to put them on the spot and make sure that they will have to um, put the sum down a little bit because the amounts that they want is quite um, unbelievable. So, so instead of um, actually just like sending them letters, we want to... Um, give them back their cost risk. That is, we want to force them to work in a real legal way, to get away from this weird mass industrialized um, system that actually does not fit uh, the idea of the practice of law that we have. So there's something we skipped just now. The Abmann Beantworter actually works in your own browser. You just put in some stuff so that the um, person who sent out the cease and desist letter actually knows your address. And th there's a PDF that is pr produced and you can just send out this PDF. Obviously, you still have to sign it but then you can just send it via regular post. And this is a pretty uh, free or cost-effective way of doing you, your first defense. So you've already put the other side on the spot. So the cost that you write down um, actually only occurs afterwards, which makes this a legal, legally binding way for you to start a new, um, a new procedure that would then have them pay money. Now let's leave the law aside a little bit. There's also a political side to this. So we actually also deal with this topic in our free time or privately because we want open and free networks. The collateral damage that we see, which is that um, the network is actually getting more closed, is something that can't happen. We fight for internet access for everyone, for better technology, for economic reasons, but also for human rights reasons. Now, I can say without internet, I probably would be a different person and I could always have internet access. I need internet access to work, to communicate, to orient myself, to make plans, to inform myself, obviously. 
jemand anderes, also auch die Unterhaltungsindustrie steckt ja dahinter. Das geht ja, ist ja nicht das And it's impossible that because someone else, that is the um, entertainment industry, that's actually already pretty profitable. And it can't be that because they want to make more profits, I'm losing my elementary human right of internet access. I want this to change and I really want to support people that share their network access. They should be supported by us. They shouldn't have this fear and insecurity. And that's why we work. What I really want to say is that I really want the Abmann Beantworter to become superfluous, to be able to take it offline, because it won't be necessary anymore. Because we think the people sending out these cease and desist letters should actually collect this information by themselves. Because usually when you get these kind of letters from a federal judge, you actually just say, no, this is not true, no, this is not true, you send it back and that's fine. And this is the way it should be here as well. There should be an easy, simple way to do that. And we hope that the um, cu customer protection services in Germany will actually be able to push this through. Unfortunately, we do not have question, time for questions anymore, but if you have comments, questions, if you want to discuss at, uh, tomorrow at 3.30 at the Freifunk Assembly, there's going to be a discussion round, and our lecturers will also be there, and you can really discuss it there.